Okay, this is uh, DSD for uh, the 21st of October. Um, so uh, we are going to cover uh, Unit 8 today. Last uh, on, on Monday we talked about the IEEE 754. And uh, today we're going to talk about uh, uh, some of the additional topics in Verilog. Okay, so here's the syllabus and as you can see so, and we don't really have too much else going on until we're going to start the final project, the first uh, class in November. And then, uh, and uh, yeah, and uh, we'll also have on the uh, 13th of November, test two, uh, the test two written, which will be chapters four to eight. So this will be the last material that will be on that test. And then after that, I think everything else is just uh, additional topics, really. Okay. Um, yeah. And we will, let's see, if we look at the labs. So this is the week uh, 19 through 23, lab sevens. Okay, so we may, yeah. So I, I, that's right. So we're basically taking two weeks to do lab seven. I forgot about that. That's good. I'm, that, yeah. And then next week we'll do lab eight lab nine, and then the SDK lab, and then we're done. So that'll be it. Um, so by the, f and I might even, I might even cancel, we'll see. Yeah, I'll, I'll probably, we'll probably do that. All right, good. Okay, so, so make sure you get lab seven done this week, get all your other labs caught up. So you then just have to do eight, nine, and the SDK, and you'll be done. And you can even do that, you can knock that out. I'll look at that. I might even drop one of these labs. We'll see. Uh, but don't count on that. Right now, we're going to do them. Okay. So let me move myself a little bit out of the way. Let's shrink down a little bit here. And then we'll put myself up here. Yeah. And there we go. All right. So, so we're going to talk about several things. So here's a... Uh, Here's an, and, and some of these things are just sort of um, interesting very log things to show you how, um, how the synthesizer is going to synthesize some things. So here's an exclusive NOR gate, okay? Uh, to input exclusive NOR. Uh, sometimes referred to as an XNOR, but it's also the same as an equivalence gate. Um, in any event, um, here's this truth table. So if both inputs are zero or both inputs are one, you get a one out. Otherwise, you get a zero out. Um, so basically, uh, if you're doing a comparison between X and Y to see which one is bigger, the output of this gate, hi baby, the output of this gate does tell you um, whether or not they're equal. Uh, and if Z is true, then then uh, then they're basically equal. Uh, if I don't know, I'm confused about this, X and R, X and Y. Right, so Z is gonna be, but they bitwise inverted it. I don't know, a little confused about that, but in any event, okay. So if Z is one, then X and Y are equal. And if Z is zero, then, uh, then they're not equal. Okay, so here's a four bit equality comparator. So we're doing each individual bit we're doing with this x nor, and uh, so then if you get if you get a if if you get a one out, as long as you get ones out of all these gates, then a equals e. But if any of these gates puts out a zero, then the output from the AND gate will be zero, and you'll know that a and e are not equal. So this is one way to do uh, to use five gates and to do a four bit equality comparator between an a and a b four bit vectors. So here's our magnitude comparator, same, same circuit we just looked at here, okay? If A is 1001 and B is 0111, is A greater than B? Well, so using this magnitude comparator, uh, the one and the zero, this, the, uh, the A3 bit here is going to give a zero out, so the output's going to be zero, which means they're no longer equal. But how would we know whether or not, how would we know whether or not A is greater than B? Well, okay, so what we really want is not are they equal, but 
we want to know if A is greater than B. So how did we do that? Well, since A3 is greater than B3, A is greater than B. So what we could test then is A3 anded with not B3 equal to 1. Therefore, one term in the logic equation A greater than B would be A3 and not B3. Okay? Or A3 and so A3B prime, essentially. Uh, A3B3 prime. All right, so let's look at this. So if we have A greater than B equals A3 and with not B prime or A3, A3B3 prime. Plus, what else do we have to know? Well, so if the higher order bit, if A3 is greater, it ended with not B3 is, uh, if that AND gate then is, is a 1, then they are greater. But, of course, uh, if they're equal, then, then this, uh, so in this particular case, if, if A3 is 1 and B3 is 0, then the result of this AND will be 0. On the other hand, if, uh, if A3 is greater, is 1, and B3 is 0, then the result of this would be 1. All right, now we have to look at the next term. So if, so if the first uh, higher bits are compared, and they in this manner and they generate a 1 then a is greater than b but what if they're equal well then this 1 will be a 0 so that won't make this expression true so then we have to look at the next bit in order so the next bit would be uh, a3 equals b3 both 0 or both 1 and therefore then a2 is greater than b2 which then we can say, so if C3 is 1 and A2 ended with not B2 is 1, then A is still greater than B. You can't just have A2 ended with uh, not B2 uh, because it's, it's, there's two conditions that have to be met. The first condition is that A3 has to equal B3, and then the second condition is that A2 has to be 1 and B2 0 for A to be greater than B. So we have, so we have for the first bit, we just have this simple comparison. But for the next bit, we have to, we have to say that this, ex, this, this exclusive NOR result has to be 1, which means they're equal. The higher order bit has to be equal. And then the next bit has, has to be A2 is 1, B2 is 0. All right? So that gives us that gives us C3, or the output of this gate, has to be a 1, and A2 and not B2. So the second term is C3 and with A2 and with not B2. All right? So we add that term in. Now what about the next bit? So now what if A3 equals B3 and A2 equals B2, which means C3 is 2, true and c2 is true and then we would say that a is greater than b if a1 is a 1 and b1 is a 0 which again then would be uh, would be the next term all right so that would be c3 is 1 c2 is 1 and a1 ended with not b1 is 1 so then we could write that uh, like this. C3 and C2 and A1 and not and not B1. So we take C3, which means A3 equals B3, C2, B1, which means A2 equals B2, and A1 is greater than B1, meaning A1 is 1, B1 is 0, which is A1 and with not B1. So if that term's true, then then what that means is that the A is greater than B, not because of the high order bit or the next bit, but because of the third bit down is greater. And then if all of this is false, 
we still have to look at the last, the lowest order bit. So now we have this expression, and now the lower order bit, we just follow the same thing. We're going to have C3 ended with C2, ended with C1, ended with A0, ended with not B0. And that should be pretty straightforward. So there is the expression. All right, so you can see that's how you can do a magnitude comparator in hardware for a 4-bit comparison to get A is greater than uh, B. So here's A equal to B. That's just C0, C1, C2, C3, and it together. And then A greater than B is just this. And then if both these things are false, then you're left with A is less than B. All right, so we'll talk a little bit about uh, Verilog functions. We're going to talk a little bit about Verilog tasks because uh, we, we've mentioned functions. We haven't really talked about tasks at all. We're going to talk about multi-valued logic, uh, how you model uh, static RAM, uh, parameters. We've mentioned parameters. Uh, we'll talk about named association. We've been using named association, but we haven't really covered it fully. And then we'll briefly talk about generate statements, even though um, uh, generate statements can come in really handy when you have a lot of things to instantiate. And then we'll talk about, for our test benches, how we can use file I.O. stuff, where we might have a disk file that we want to run against our test bench. These file I.O. functions are obviously not available in, uh, 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 to be synthesized. Okay, so Verilog functions. So uh, let me bring my face back here. So Verilog, Verilog functions then, uh, it's a key feature of VLSI circuits. Uh, the repeated use of similar structures. And when you have repeated use of similar structures, that's, that's especially when, uh, when Verilog functions uh, can be used, and also tasks can be used to great advantage. Now, the function, unlike modules, modules cannot be defined in other modules. But a function can be defined within a module in which it's used. So a function can be defined inside the module you use it in. Or, if you want, it can, be, uh, it can be your function definitions could all be in a separate file, which you could include, and then you could just uh, only use the ones that you really need. So you could have your own sort of personal include file with all, a whole bunch of functions you've defined. A function returns a value by assigning the value to a function name. So it, it works just like a function in C with a few caveats. The function's return value can be a single bit or it can be a vector. And functions can call other functions, but a function cannot call a task. So a function typically models combinational logic, not sequential. So it's so it's not a it's not a process block. Or it's not a, it's, it, it, we don't put all these blocks in functions. Or if you do, you intend them to be a uh, result in combinational logic. And it always executes in zero time. So you can't specify delays for purposes of your simulations. You also can't have any edge signals inside, uh, it, uh, you can't send any edge signals to the function. You, you can have any number of inputs but you only get one output. Now that output can be a vector, so it can have it can be multiple bits. But it has to be a single, uh, it has to be either a single bit or a vector. And 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 then when you declare it, that's that's what it determines, and we'll, we'll, you'll see how that is. And it, uh, you can use local variables, and you can use global variables within, within the function. All right, here's an example of a function. This function is called rotate right. And uh, the input is, the, is register address. It's an 8-bit vector. It returns this 8-bit rotate right vector. And so uh, here's the guts of the function. It's begin and end and then end function. Rotate right equals register address 
sh shifted right by one bit. Now, uh, so here's the, so we see this as rotate right equals the register address uh, arithmetically shifted one place to the right. Now, you, you have to remember about the arithmetic shift versus the logical shift. The two, two uh, carrots, uh, one way or the other way, uh, give you logical functions. Three give you uh, arithmetic. And in the arithmetic case, uh, when you shift uh, to the right, if it's assigned, if it's assigned value, then you will uh, you will fill with the uh, with the uh, uh, the higher order bit. So in this case, uh, we're going to fill with a one. Uh, and of course, you leave the past value unchanged. So it returns it returns this doesn't change the A. So you would say B is assigned the results of the function rotate right operating on A. Now remember, the function takes an 8-bit uh, an vector and it returns an 8-bit vector. So B should be an 8-bit vector, A should be an 8-bit eight, eight vector. The value in the parentheses is what gets passed. And what you set equal to the expression is what gets loaded with the return value, just like in a function, just like in a function in C, like a C function. Okay, um, so uh, so here's another example of a function. This is called parity. Now the way this works, it takes in this case it takes a four-bit vector and it returns a 5-bit vector because the return because the, the function name parity is defined as 4 to 0 or a 5-bit vector whereas the input is defined as 3 to 0 and, and it only takes one input uh, one input function in the parentheses and so then you define the return uh, register here and then begun parity equals you can you uh, you exclusive or all, all four bits together and it will be odd it, parity will be a one if you have an odd number of ones whereas parity will be a zero if you have an even number of ones so basically when you're all said and done you're going to have an even number of ones so you're setting this up for even parity Yeah, and that's what this says. It returns a 5-bit code with even parity. Okay, so, uh, and notice, uh, because in the name of the function is parity, you, you set the name, and it's defined as a 5-bit vector, you set, the, you set that equal to this result concatenated with, the, with A, which was the value passed. And in this case, they've, they've concatenated it as the least, the low order bit. You obviously, in many cases, we would have concatenated that as a higher order bit uh, in standard parity uh, form. And so, uh, and then you just say parity equals B. I don't know why you couldn't just say parity equals uh, A concatenated with parity there. But anyway, they didn't do that. All right. And so here's where it would be used. Y is assigned the result of parity of X. So this function adds two four-bit vectors and a carry bit. Illustrates function creation and use of a loop. Takes a five-bit sum. All right, so we define function. The name of the function is add four, and add four is going to be the result, and it's going to be a five-bit sum, which will be essentially four bits of sum and a carry out. And we're going to pass three things in. Two four-bit vectors and a single bit carry in. And they have to be in this order, A, B, and carry in. And then we're going to define sum as a four-bit vector, a five-bit vector rather, and carry out as a single bit.
Now you can see we have internal signals, sum and carry out, and those are going to be concatenated to generate our, our five bit result. Oh, I take that back. Um, they're not, the, we're going to, sum is, we only really need four bits for sum, and then the carry out is going to be concatenated as that fifth bit uh, here. Sum bit four equals carry out, and then add four equals sum, and add four, of course, is the name here. Uh, of the function, and that's what has to be equal to the result to return that 5-bit vector. Okay, so uh, so we, we define an integer i, and then we have a little for loop here, and we're going to count uh, from 0 to, th to, to 3, so we're going to go through it four times. Remember, uh, in very long, you can't, you can't use um, plus plus, so you have to say i equals i plus 1. And then um, here we go. Carry out equals uh, uh, this construct, which uh, gets our carry out, and the sum is this exclusive or of a, b, and carry in. And we do that. Uh, we do that for each bit. And then we go through this four times to generate the four bits. And uh, the at the end of it, we always set, and notice we're using blocking in here. At the end of it, we use cn equals c out. Now this this whole setup here is intended to be uh, combinational logic. It's not intended to synthesize. Um, yeah, it's, it's it is combinational logic. And then when we're all done, we make sure that the the carry out, the final carry out is the fourth is the fifth bit of sum. And then we set sum equal to add four, which is what we're going to return. And that's the end of the function. Here's how it's used. So we pass to it x, well, a, b, and a carry in. Now here the carry in is passed in as a uh, as a constant which is funny the way they put it in quotes here. Uh, and then we have x and not y. So we're taking the, we're taking the bitwise inverse of y. So it's a four bit vector and we're flipping all the bits, which basically means, and we're making you carry one. So do you see what's happening here? We're actually subtracting y from x because we're inverting y and adding one. So that's making it two's complement. This could also be this could also be just a one it could also be a one tick uh, b one. All right. So here's a function called to compute squares and then showing how it's actually used. So um, so we're going to declare it within the function that we're going to use it in. So uh, here is the module test squares clock. Uh, has an input clock and uh, it has four bit FN and eight bits answer. So, and we're going to call um, we're going to call the name of our function squares, and squares then will be the eight bit vector that gets returned, and the input would be a single uh, four bit uh, vector that we'll call number. And here's our definition. Squares equal number times number. Now, I'm, yeah, so, okay, so a couple of things. Let me just say something about multiplying vectors because it can be a little bit tricky. One of the things that happens is uh, Verilog will look at the size of squares number and number, and it will use the largest bits width of, of any of those variables, well, two variables. And in this case, the, the, the largest bit width is, is going to be uh, uh, 8, because squares is defined as 8. So it's going to do it, it's going to give me an 8-bit multiplication. Um, and uh, so here's that, so basically, um, function is squares and squares is just defined as number times number 
uh, so you're going to get a 8-bit result. So now let's see how it's used. So initial begin. So we have a function. Uh, fn is again 4 bits. We're going to define it as 3. And then we're going to say in this always block that answer equals uh, the squares of function. Now what's really nice is that you know that you cannot call modules from, a, from an always block. But you can call function. You can put a function in an always block. So you can't put, a, you can't put a module in an always block, but you can put a function. And so that's, that's one of the reasons why functions are particularly useful. So if you're, gonna, if you're gonna use a particular operation a number of different times, making it into a function is really a great idea. Okay, so functions are a good way to reuse procedural code since modules cannot be invoked from procedure. You can't call a module inside an always block. You might have a code segment that needs to appear in more than one always block. That's a perfect time to make it as a function. And here's some of the general rules for functions. Functions must contain at least one input argument. Functions cannot contain an input or output declaration. Functions cannot contain time-controlled statements at pound, add, or wait. You don't get, uh, you don't get, uh, there's no time delays. Functions cannot enable tasks. And a function must contain the statement that assigns the return value to the implicit function name. So, for instance, here, uh, the implicit function name is squares. You have to have a statement inside this function that assigns something to squares. In this case, our, our number times number, which is what we wanted. If we go back and look at this one, here the function is add 4, and we have to add 4. We had sum, and we append that last carry out to the sum bit of 4. So we, we, then sum is 4 bits, which is really, uh, sorry, it's 5 bits which is uh, four bits of sum and one bit of carry out appended to the most significant bit. And then we set it equal to add four, then, then that satisfies the requirement that the function name, which represents a variable, must be assigned inside the function. We'll look at one more. Uh, here we had parity. So parity is the name of the function, and here parity gets assigned. In this case, it gets assigned A with, par with the parity bit concatenated uh, as the low order bit. Okay, and um, then, um, yeah, I think that's, so that's all these uh, general rules. Okay, tasks. Okay, so a task, uh, unlike a function, which only returns a single value or a vector, tasks don't actually return it. But a task is more like a module in that you have a parameter list. And some of the parameters are inputs and some of the parameters are outputs. Um, you, you have to have a separate statement for a task, whereas a function can be part of can be part of another statement. A task cannot be, it has to be a statement in and of itself. Um, and uh, a, a, a task can be sequential or concurrent, whereas a, a function generally is, is, uh, is always concurrent. Um, so here's an example. Task name, you have, you have a task keyword, task name, and then you have input declarations and output declarations. And then you have the internal parameters and then you have whatever uh, sequential statements that you need inside the task. Uh, and then here is your task name. Uh, and you have uh, some parameter list that, li that includes your inputs and your outputs. And then the task, uh, the outputs are what the task returns, obviously. So you can define the task in the module in which it's going to be used. 
or you can define it in a separate file, just like a function. And then you can include it with an include tick include directive, and uh, and then you can use it. Tasks can include timing delays. Okay, so we're going to use an example of a task called addVec. It's a add vector task, and it's going to add two four-bit data, uh, two four-bit vectors, and a carry, and return a four-bit sum and a carry out. So basically, a, b, carry in, sum, carry out, where a, b, and sum are the four bits of data, and c in and c out uh, are, uh, are single bits. Okay, so here it is. You define the, the, the parameter list just like you would for a module, except there's no parenthesis up here. Input, add one. Input, add two. Four, you know, four bits. Input, carry in. Output, four bits of sum. And an output, carry out bit. Then you have an internal register C that's a single bit. And your C becomes a carry in. And then you have this uh, internal statement here uh, where uh, you use integer i and you count. You go through this four times. Your sum is the uh, Exclusive or of uh, add of your sum sub i is the um, the the exclusive or of add one sub i add two sub i and the carry which is initially the carry in but then it's passed the new carry then becomes uh, uh, the this result and then we have. Uh, uh, the carry out then uh, is after you run through this four times, then the carry out is assigned the value of uh, the last carry. All right. So tasks can, are sections of code that basically it, it is, it's very helpful to be reusable. Now, one difference between functions and tasks is in functions, uh, you, you cannot specify any time delays. So if you need to specify time delays or you want to use this in test benches, then a task can be very helpful. Um, and that's that's probably one of the primary differences, I mean, other, other than syntactically how they're set up. Um, if you have repetitive operations, uh, then rather than rewriting the code, you should use tasks, and uh, that'll help with your, you know, that, that should make it more readable, uh, cleaner, and less likely to, be, uh, to have problems. Okay, moving on, past functions and tasks. The only way to really um, the only way to really get any facility with tasks and functions is to start trying to use them in your code. And I would encourage you in your next lab to try and come up with try and use a function in one and maybe a task in, in the next one. All right, for value logic. So we've talked about this in logic design. Uh, in 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 uh, in VHDL we have five value logic. Well, really nine value logic, but only five of them are really used much and uh and it's unknown well it's it's uninitialized for you unknown zero one and high impedance but in very log we only have four unknown which also includes uninitialized and and actually that's not quite true we'll we'll, sh we'll talk about this later eventually i guess but in very log if uh, if a register is unknown is un is is uninitialized then its values will be unknown and if a uh wire is uninitialized, then it will be high Z. It'll be disconnected. So that's how those are treated in very long. All right, signals in a four variable, a four value logic can assume the four value, the four values of unknown, zero, one are disconnected, which we call high impedance. Now we can we can actually use these, and this comes up, uh, we get these. Uh, in our constants, and when we talked about constants, we mentioned this. So here we have, uh, if the, uh, uh, so we're, we're doing an always block here, and this is level stuff, okay, so A or B. If, if B is equal to one, then we assign F equals A. But if B is zero, then that means this buffer is going to be disconnected. And so F is assigned the high Z state. And then here we do C or Z. And uh, if D is equal to one, then F equals C, but otherwise it's gonna be high Z. This allows us to create buses in Verilog where we have our gated 
buffers driving the bus, and we can put them in high Z state so that only one buffer is driving the bus at any given time so we don't have short circuits. All right, so here's our static RAM module. This is actually, um, well, this is, so this is how we, uh, this is how we do, you know, we, we set up uh, a block of static RAM. So let's say we have uh, two to the n words by m bits. So let's say uh, we have eight bit words and maybe we have, you know, 32 of them or something. So, uh, so that would be uh, two to the fifth, okay? Two to the fifth words, so n would be five and m would be eight. Uh, all right, so, and this is gonna be static RAM. So first off, we have address lines. We have n of them, so five of them in this case. And then we'd have a, a chip select, which is active low, an output enable, active low, a write enable, active low, and then our data lines, which are bi-directional, and there'd be M of those because we, we would have a data line for each column in our model. And since we said we were going to have uh, eight bits in each word, then we would have eight data lines. Obviously, it could be set up with any, num any, any, any parameters you wanted to choose, although we almost always use powers of two for the number of words. So we, we use our tri-state uh, buffers to drive, especially the data lines where they're bi-directional. So here's our truth table. So if, uh, if our output enable is, uh, if, our chips, if our chip's deselected, which means it's not low, it's, it's, active, it's inactive high, then uh, all the IO pins are in high Z state. If on the other hand, our chip's selected, but our output enable is inactive high, then we're, the output's disabled and we're still, our IO pins are in high Z state. If on the other hand, our chip's selected and our output's enabled, then our write enable is, uh, is, uh, is high, then, uh, then we're gonna see the data come out of the, of, the, of the RAM. So we're basically reading the RAM. And then if our write enable is low, active low, it takes precedence over the output enable and allows the data to be written into the RAM. Okay, and here's just a summary of our control lines. So the chip select has to be asserted low for anything to happen, otherwise the chip's not working. But if the chip's turned on, then if our output enable is, uh, is, is low, then the memory can can, whatever we've selected in our address will be output on the data bus. If, on the other hand, uh, our, uh, our output enable is high, then the data bus will be free. If the write enable is low, then, then, then the data uh, bus will also uh, allow for the data to, to flow in. And that means you can write to the memory. So here's a... So here's a RAM. Um, it's it's called RAM 6116. It has a uh, uh, a chip select, a write enable, an output enable, and a uh, dr an address and the I/O lines. So the address is eight bits. So it's going to have 256 bytes, and the word size is eight bits. So it's going to have eight data lines. And uh, since, it's, since it has eight address lines, we're going to have uh, 256 words in this RAM. And here we define it. And this is basically where we create it, just like we did our ROM. We have eight bit words, and we're going to have 256 of them. Notice here, we go high bit to low, but here we, we often usually do go low to high because uh, our lowest RAM address would be zero, our highest RAM address would be 255, which would require our eight address lines to be 111111. Now, uh, notice how we do this. We, we assign our IO, so we test, is our chip select one, or is our uh, write enable, uh, 
Yeah, so this is our this is our test, right? So we're going to test either if chip select is one or the uh, the uh, right the uh, our right enable is zero, which means it's active, which means data coming in, or our output is inactive. Then we're going to be in high Z state. Otherwise, if the, if that's not true, then our RAM is uh, our our RAM output is going to be uh, outputting whatever the address is. So this is the variable RAM one. We're going to address one of these uh, 256 locations, and those eight bits then will be assigned to the I/O, which is again an out an eight put eight bit output. So here's our here's our always block. We're going to check for the positive edge of our write enable or the negative edge of our chip select. So whenever the chip select goes negative, or the or the uh, the write enable goes up, then uh, we're going to set RAM address equal to, and again this address is just whatever we have on our address lines. It's going to be equal to our input lines. So that's so this always block is how we're going to write to their chip to our RAM. Otherwise, the RAM, if the chip select is active, the write and the write enable is inactive, uh, and the output enable is active, then we're just going to be we're just going to be outputting uh, the data, and that'll be right here. Whatever's addressed, that will come out. But here's where we actually write. All right, so hopefully this makes sense. So this is a simple uh, random access memory model. Okay, we've talked about parameters before. Um, and uh, we, we know that parameters are one of the things that we can change when we in, instantiate a module. And that's what makes them useful. And we've done that when we instantiate our top module in our test bench. We've used the parameters to change around our clock so we didn't have to take 100 million ticks of our clock to get one output. Um, and you can, and every time you instantiate a module, you can use, you can change the parameters if you want. You can instantiate with the different parameters every single time. Uh, there's two ways to change the parameters. Uh, one of them is what we've already been doing when you just specify it when you instantiate it. And the other is to use this uh, def parm statement. The def parm statement requires the full hierarchical path of the parameter you're trying to change. And that's why modules, that's one of the reasons at least, why modules require uh, a named instantiation. So for instance, here's flip-flop. We have two parameters for this flip-flop and it's, we call this instantiation one. And let's say this happens to appear in the top level module. So then you're, you could have a def parm statement anywhere. And you could, and since the uh, parameters in this, uh, uh, in this flip flop, uh, we didn't, we didn't, we don't have it defined here, but one of them was width, uh, I forget, one, one of the parameters was width. Oh, how many bit, how many, so it's a, it's a register essentially. Okay. And, uh, and, what we're doing here, using this def parm statement, which can be anywhere in your code, even in other files, but it reaches in, it references the top level module, it references the instantiation of this line by instance underscore one, and it references the parameter by its name width, which we don't actually know that, but that's apparently what it was. And then it sets the value to seven. Now in this case, it was seven, but you could change this to anything you wanted with this def parm statement. So now here's an example, uh, say for the NAND2. You could instantiate the NAND2 and set up the parameters uh, 2, 1, and 2. And then in this case, you could instantiate it uh, and, not, and not change any of those parameters and let them be just whatever the default is. 
This instantiation would be called U1. This would be called U2. But with a def parm statement, you could reference these. If they were in the top level module, you could call it top dot U1 dot and then whatever name parameter you wanted to mess with. So sometimes we'll we'll use uh, for these parameters we'll we'll use uh, we'll let them do calculations, which will uh, uh, let the parameters specify different uh, uh, gate delays depending on how many gates they're driving. In other words, the output load on the output of the gate. And so that, that can be a factor. Um, and you can do a lot of different things. Here you can have a calculation of T rise plus three nanoseconds times the load. And T fall is, is plus two nanoseconds times the load. And then you can change the load. They're all, so T rise, T fall, and load are all parameters that can be changed. So here's an example. Uh, we have this module called a NAN, a NAN2, a NAN, you know, a two input NAND gate, A, B input, C output, it has three parameters, a load, a rise time, and a fall time. And then uh, we specify down here that this delay is T rise plus three times the load, and T fall is, and this is T fall plus three times the load. So these just are different parameters for when C goes to one, or when oh, C goes to zero. All right, now we instantiate it, and notice since there, there are default times here, so if you don't specify, you're gonna get three for T rise, two for T fall, and one for load. Here, we specified, so we get two for T rise, one for T fall and two for load. Here we didn't specify in, in our U2 instantiation, and so we just get the defaults. So the parameter declaration of the module specifies default values. When U1 is instantiated, the parameter map specifies different times for all of them. But when U2 is instantiated, there's no parameter map included, so the default times are used. Okay, and there's a whole bunch of different examples you can use. You can also use parameters for constants like pi or for your clock frequency or for a whole bunch of different things for the size for the for the word size uh, the max bit whatever here's a flip-flop uh, so this would be like a register okay um, and so 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 D could be a vector of with minus one to zero, so in this case, eight bits by default, seven to zero, and you can have a built-in inertial delay of 10 nanoseconds. And then your output would be the same. You'd have eight bits of Q coming out, eight bits of D going in, eight bits of Q coming out, and then your inertial delay uh, specified here would be 10 nanoseconds. So your named parameters are width and inertial delay. And you can change these every time you instantiate the flip-flop. So here's your top module. And uh, notice here, you instantiate your flip-flop. Notice the top module is named top. Uh, so you would say def parm top comma instant one comma width, and you specify seven. And that, that reaches in, and this, 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 this can be anywhere in your program, anywhere in your whole project. And they'll reach into this module, reach down to this instantiation, and change the parameter of width, or set it equal to 7. And then you can also just instantiate it and, change, and set them 7 and 25. So then this would be a, a width of 7, and uh, where is it? Uh, doesn't really. Yeah, a width of so width of seven, which is going to be your number of bits. So in this case, you'd only have you'd only have seven bits of Q instead of eight, and then your inertial delay. So your delay would be twenty five. All right, and I think is that yeah because of width minus one, so it would be seven minus one or six. All right. 
Uh, here's another one. Uh, so you could have a parameter named number and then a parameter named uh, data value. Number can be divided by 10, so that would be 4 tenths. When number changes, the D value is automatically updated. So when using the DEFPARM construct, you must provide the path as demonstrated. You can't leave out an entry in the list of parameters if you're changing them, uh, if you're changing them in an instantiation of the module unless you use named association. So just like with module instantiation, with, with, when you instantiate uh, a module with parameters, you can use named association for the parameters as well. Um, but if you don't use named association, then you have to put all the entries in. If, let's say you have three parameters and you want to change the third one in the list, you have to go back and specify all, the first two, otherwise you can't really get to the third one. Or you can use the dot notation and then you can specify just the third one. And all the dependencies, if you do math inside of them, would be automatically updated. Parameters are basically fixed when you uh, at, at compile time. They they don't they don't get changed during during once the hardware is made. They don't they don't they don't they're not they're not variables then at that point. They they wind up being constants once your program is compiled or uh, synthesized. Here's an example of named association. Uh, with a module, and we, we've looked at this. So here's the definition of the module, full adder. When you instantiate it, you put in the name here, and then in the parentheses, you put the value you want to, uh, to use with that name. And, you, and there, should be, there should be dots in here. Uh, yeah, so if you put them in order, yeah, that's fine. But if you go out of order, then you have to do the dot. So you do dot sum, dot c out, dot x. So you use the actual names in your module definition, and then you associate them with um, you associate them with whatever parameters you're using for that instantiate them by putting inside the parentheses. And here they can be in any order you want. They don't have to follow this order. So in this case, sum came first down here but it's second here. But in positional association, the sum would have to be second. All right, uh, let's see. I think we did, uh... yeah, here's your, here's using, uh, notice for the parameters, you can do this named association too, just like you can for the, for the module parameters. Or for the for the module for the module variables, yeah. So you can use so you can use named association for both a module instantiation of the variables that you're passing, and you can use named association for the values of the parameters you might want to change. Whereas if you use positional notation on the parameters, then you have to you if you have to include them all or if you want to do the second one, you still have to include the first one because you, you can't just skip one. Okay, generate statement. I may, um, I may quit here. Uh, well, let me just mention this. The generate statement is a way to, uh, to uh, it's, a, it's a very law construct that allows you uh, an easy way of instantiating a whole bunch of similar components. Basically, it's a it's an array of identical operations, but you can you can uh, change um, you can change subscripts and stuff. And anyway, I don't think I'm, I, I I wouldn't encourage you to use this unless you uh, just really want to play around with it. Then you can spend a little time going through this. But um, when when the uh, when your code's compiled, you get this set of uh, concurrent statements generated for each value of the identifier in a given range. And so it's like a for loop to generate very log statements, essentially. And it, this happens when you compile your code. doesn't happen at runtime or when your hardware is running. Uh, it's already done. It happens when it's uh, creating it. And this is an example. Generate i0 to uh, 1, 2, 3. Um, and you have a full adder. A sub i, B sub i, C sub i, C sub i plus 1, S sub i. And it's going to generate then, uh, 
here's your full adder. And what it's going to do, it's going to generate these instantiations. Um, and you can have conditional generates. <laughs> anyway, I, I'm not going to talk about that. File I.O. functions. If you're running a, uh, if you're running a test bench, you can use uh, files to both read and write if you want to. You may want to save your test bench results into a file. You may want to read a, a long file and exercise it against your test bench. Maybe you're doing a math coprocessor and you're, uh, you wrote a new routine for generating, say, uh, signs. And you want, to, you want to look at a whole bunch of different angles uh, and compare them uh, to make sure it's generating it correctly. Well, then you can, instead of having it print out inside Vivado, you can have it write it all to a file, and then you could put the file in, uh, you know, in an Excel spreadsheet or something and look at it or whatever. And these are, uh, I, we probably won't use these, but there's basically, they're very similar to the C standard I.O. functions like fopen, fclose. Um, and you basically open the file, and then you uh, close it when you're done. So, and there's, there are the instructions. Open, open or close an existing file. Test for end the file. Test for an error on the last uh, read or write. Uh, get a single character. Put a single character. Uh, parses formatted text. So this is the scanf line, essentially, and printf, essentially. F printf, F scanf. And then read, write. And then uh, to read a data file from uh, and store it in memory, you can use this. Or to read, uh, yeah. So here's an example of very low code to, to read a hexadecimal data file using the read memory h command, and then you can use it to uh, in a test bench to uh, to present these as uh, as exemplars to your to your top module to see you know, how it if it's doing it right. All right, I don't th I think I'm going to quit with this. That's pretty much it. Uh, we probably won't use files, although I mean you can. They're not that complicated to set up. Uh, but they're really just for test benches. So you you need to you want to you want to you might you, you have to need to exercise quite a you know a lot of data against your uh, against your file against your your top module to see you know if it's going to function correctly. We're we're probably not writing anything uh, that requires that level. So okay, so that's pretty much what I wanted to cover. Uh, hopefully that. Um, Hopefully that gets us uh, rolling along here. Um, I definitely um, so uh, so we so that pretty well covers. Let's see. I think I'll pop this up. Where's my thing here? Did I kill it already? Oh, I did. Hang on a second. Let me just pop it right back up. And we'll go to the end. So, so like I said at the beginning, we uh, so this is the 21st. Uh, we pretty much covered all of eight, and we had some more days lined up for it. Uh, I probably won't do a lecture for Friday then, um, and uh, next week I'll cover nine and start reviewing for the written test. So uh, this this Friday then there uh, won't be a uh, lecture. Uh, kind of back to what I said. Remember, it's it's really a, it's a two three course. There really was only supposed to be two hours of lecture per week. Of course, uh, letting you out of class doesn't really help you since there is no class. Uh, but uh, but you don't have to review you you don't have to view a lecture on this Friday. So I'll give you a little bit of a break, and then we'll pick that up uh, next week. Uh, there will be a test associate a quiz associated with this one. All right, I think that'll do it.